Hey, hey everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion hosted by Elise with the topic Engineering 2030, where today it's all about the future of you and me, the engineers, and how technological advances will shape the world around us and how that will ultimately affect our day-to-day -day work life. Um, the way products are developed and thus how engineers, so you and me, work will probably change more in the coming decades than it did in the past 20 to 30 years. The questions we will cover range from trends and forces that will impact the daily work and projects of engineers, but also cover the aspects of learning and how we, the engineers, can prepare for upcoming disruptive changes. At the end of the session, you will be able to have some time to cover all your questions in a dedicated Q&A session. So if you have any questions to the panelists, myself, or maybe the Elise Academy, as you can see, um, feel free to ask that in the Q&A session. A little bit about the context of the session. The goal is basically to talk about engineers of the future, in particular about engineering 2030, and to give you, the listeners, impulses, but also very concrete approaches and ideas for your day-to-day -day life as an engineer and how you can prepare yourself for the future. Um, the context in which engineers perform the act of engineering is changing in a rapid pace. Information is, increasing, is increasingly accessible. Collaboration is ever more flexible and agile. The energy and mobility industry are experiencing ongoing transitions, to name a few. By 2030, the field of engineering will significantly change and your daily life by handling some of today's complex tasks with great efficiency. The question is, however, how? And today I'm more than happy to welcome panelists. Um, and I will want to introduce Moritz first as our first speaker for today's session. Moritz roots lie in the aerospace and engineering industry. He defended a doctoral thesis in the field of product development processes. As a technical consultant in the field of additive manufacturing and generative design, Moritz leads Elise as a managing director on the way to develop software for generative engineering. Welcome, Moritz. Welcome, Yusuf. Welcome, everybody. A warm welcome from my side. I'm happy to be here in the panel discussion and really looking forward for a fruitful round of impulses and insights here. Thanks. The next panelist is Marco Witzmann. Marco is a former satellite engineer who was frustrated by the fact that hardware engineers are losing countless hours working on siloed and outdated data, while software engineers had amazing tooling at their fingertips. So in 2016, he co-founded Valley Space, a digital productivity tool that helps engineers develop everything from coffee roasters to rockets. Welcome, Marco. Hi, thanks for having me. Great. The next panelist is Sebastian Flüglen. As project manager for innovations at the EDAC Group and founder of Indemise.com, Sebastian is working for a more sustainable future. He's pushing new technologies like generative design, AI, and edit additive manufacturing to create better products faster. His career at the engineering supplier EDAC started nine years ago at the Department for Automotive Interior and Exterior Development. Very thrilled to have you on board today. Yeah, nice to meet you all. Hi. And the next panelist is Oliver Koch. Oliver is an engineering veteran, I would call him like that. Starting in 1999, he worked at Airbus in the Simulation and Structural Analysis Department. He held different management roles in the development of A400M and A350 fuselage structures and was involved in research and development with a focus on design for 3D printing, automation, and digitalization of design processes. Right now, and with no surprise, Oliver is working as an independent freelance engineer in the aerospace industry working on conceptual design studies. Welcome on board, Oliver. Hi, thanks for having me. And the last panelist for today's session is Bastian Schäfer. Bastian is a cabin and cargo innovation manager at Airbus Operations and leads a group of fast thinking engineers who are building out a concept plane. Previously at Airbus, he worked on a development of A380 stairs and components for in-flight entertainment. He considers himself a mechanical engineer and has a special interest in cars. Welcome, uh, welcome Bastian. Thanks Yudele, for the intro. And before we jump straight into our poll, a little bit about myself. I'm your host and moderator for today's session, Yusuf Murad, and I'm a product marketing engineer at a company called Monolith based in London, and we use artificial intelligence for engineering data. My background is in finite element method and computational fluid dynamics. And I'm very happy to meet you all. So with that, we can kick off the first poll for today's session, which will appear in a few seconds. And the first question would be about your professional background. So what describes your current situation the best? Are you a student? Are you a professional engineer, maybe working in the academic field? Or do you have no engineering experience at all? I'll give you 30 to 40 seconds for that. Okay. 
Maybe we can even see the results. Okay, a lot of professional engineers with 56%, students 17%. We even have freelancers here, academics only 2%. No engineering experience, which shouldn't matter that much because we also talk about learning in general in today's session. Yeah, very excited to have you all on board. With that, let's close it and jump straight to the next question. Take a few seconds. The outlook on the future, which is very interesting because at the end of the session, we want to ask the same question again. Do you have like a positive attitude towards the future? Is it more like a dystopian feeling of no, the future will be so bad, AI will destroy all of us? Or are you not sure? What do you think? Oh, that, that looks good. So everyone's quite positive, a few negative ones, but maybe we can change your attitude towards the end of this panel. Very interesting. And last but not least, we have another poll right now coming up before we jump straight into the first question. And what do you think are the most critical skills for engineers of the future? Is it more like mastering a new software, for example, a new programming language? Is it more about shifting your mindset and approach, how you handle complexity? Is it how you share knowledge in terms of data? Is it that we improve collaboration, whether that's collaborating in the metaverse as engineers? Um, what do you think? Okay, it's quite equally distributed. That's very interesting. And with that, I think we can jump straight into the first question, which is um, obviously engineering is a very knowledge-driven profession. And to what extent do you see a change coming, whether that's caused by artificial intelligence or any other technology such as quantum computing? Um, yeah, maybe give us your thoughts. Maybe we'll start with Moritz as the first speaker. Uh, thanks, Murat. That's a good question. I mean, knowledge actually, is something that uh, we have to learn at the very beginning. I mean, I learned it in my studies and uh, I guess you did too. And now in my professional life, I guess I have to, to know what I have learned, but I do not need to know everything in detail because I guess it's same, maybe like Wikipedia, you can look it up if you know where to look it up. So it's more that you have to learn where to find information and how to find them. But of course, there comes a problem with it. So if you just uh, look something up, you could be uh, looking the false information up, like you look not the uh, facts on Wikipedia, for example. So I guess it's um, something which we have to learn you to really um, identify which kind of information is right and which is maybe not correct or not correct in my context in here. So I think knowledge itself is getting more accessible, but also, of course, the, yeah, the discussion, if it's the right knowledge, uh, this is becoming a completely new field in information. Interesting. What would you say to that, Bastian? Any other thoughts? Um, well, what I experience in my professional uh, life is that um, we are uh, radically changing the processes and therefore also the mindset uh, of the engineers. So what was drawn by hand uh, in the past is now more objective of uh, writing code or at least uh, try to influence um, that the code is correct. So um, you don't need to be a programmer in, in many cases, so other people can do this for you, but what the program shall execute and which tasks in your daily engineering life shall be executed with that is um, fundamentally crucial uh, for upcoming engineering uh, generations, um, I would say. So they need to get more used to programming in one way or the other, I would say. Do you yeah. think it's, oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Do you think it's only program or even other skills? Maybe Sebastian, what do you think on that aspect? Yeah, um, from my perspective, I would um, divide the challenges uh, that we are facing in the inside out um, changes and the outside in changes. So. I consider inside out as that maybe you have to use new technologies um, in our daily work as an engineer, but there are, I, from my perspective, there are much bigger challenges from the outside. So we have, to, as engineers, we have to 
develop the future that we have to 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 solve these huge challenges uh, um, that are surrounding us so yeah climate change pollution uh, population overpopulation um yeah mobility uh, changes so um, on the one side so we have these technologies that we implement in our daily work I call that the inside out um, challenges to make use of all these uh, technologies, but the outside challenges um, that we have to solve as an engineer, as an engineer are much bigger than, than yeah, just adapting new technology and, um, yeah, and um, setting up a new mindset. Mm, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, also that brings up another point of collaboration, the collaboration aspect, like amongst engineers talking to each other, solving very complex problems. How do you see the, the aspect of collaboration, Marco? Um, I, I have the feeling that we often think of technologies as empowering that single person, right? Like you are sitting there and the AI is helping you or you are like doing the programming, but uh, the products that we're developing are getting more and more complex. So we always have to think about the whole team. It's about the whole team understanding the product, which gets more and more complex. It's about the whole team collaborating on solving problems. It's about knowledge sharing and knowing where which information lies, but also which changes have been made and so on. So I have the feeling that we shouldn't just focus on the technological abilities that we need basically to handle um, those new technologies, but it's also the question of how can we as a team get into uh, process and tools that help us develop products more in a more agile way, uh, which contains a lot of information exchange and togetherness in, in solving parts of the problem and bringing them together. That's super interesting. Yeah, Oliver, maybe a follow-up question on that because you're, like, you're kind of the veteran in this panel discussion. Where do you see that, like when you look at the trajectory, looking maybe 20, 30 years back um, on how engineering was done back then versus how it's done now and in, maybe in the future? What would you say how it will change? The yeah, when I, when I look back 20, 30 years ago and, and now, um, at least in the aerospace uh, uh, industry, it's not big of a difference there. It's still very much document oriented, still working with the tools, these legacy tools. And I think that's a problem that, that companies who were, say, high tech in the 1990s, um, um, they, they have a huge legacy and, and, and um, they, they dragging something behind yeah so it's it's not easy for them to um free themselves from from that legacy uh, but that's required both in from a tool point of view and i think from an from a mindset point of view to to go away from uh, the old document oriented thinking towards a more process oriented data oriented thinking um, and also skip some tools yeah Mm -hmm. Do you think, Oliver, that would also cause a shift in how engineers generally learn and adapt to complexity? Um, yes, I think so. I think so. Um, you, you, in, in, up to now, in, in many, say, say, classical companies, you have a very specialized uh, yeah, design group or engineering group. Yeah? So for every task, there is a specialist. Um, and I think that that doesn't reflect what what we need in the future. If we want to, if we want to um, develop new products, um, there are no experts for the future. Yeah. So uh, uh, engineers will have to learn new stuff um, that they haven't done before. Yeah. So they may have to deal with hydrogen. They may have to deal with whatever. I don't know. Um, so it's very important for any engineer. Um, to, to be able to learn new disciplines quickly and fast. Interesting. Yeah. More and what, what university, uh, so the basic education has to provide is not teaching engineers project management or I don't know, CATIA or tools or whatever. Uh, it's, it's teaching, it's, it's giving them a really very, very good education in first principles. And that includes also algorithmic thinking, not the programming language that changes every other year, but algorithmic thinking and physical thinking, um, that's important, I think. That's so interesting, Oliver. I would fully agree, like thinking from first principles. I think um, maybe going to Moritz, who is more like a defender of the standpoint that engineers have to become inventors again. Maybe you could elaborate on that aspect. 
Uh, it goes in the same direction, like Oliver said. I mean, if we are facing new innovations like zero emission flights or electromobility, I mean, a car company that has like developed like uh, like fuel engines has not developed electric motors in the past. So we have to learn again to reinvent those things. And I guess this is the origin of being an engineer, being an inventor and coming up with a new idea, with a new machine that works, actually. And I guess that uh, most of the engineers have not learned this. Well, not during studies and not during their uh, life in the past and in, in their everyday tasks because they have been using software tools and like doing the stuff that they have been told to do and they did it like Oliver said like they have been doing like the 30 years in the past and now we have come to a tipping point either it's like the climate change or it's like I guess any any kind of um, disruption that focuses on here also like for example if you have to develop software in parallel with hardware this is a completely new challenge that we have never been facing in that approach in the past. And so I guess uh, yeah, engineers have to become inventors again and have to think in solutions and first principles and the tools and the doing and the design, this has to be automated at some point because we just do not have any time for this anymore. And I guess their algorithmic uh, modeling or algorithms come into play because I guess also those tools and those algorithms are ready to support us engineers in doing the tasks that we have been doing manually in the last years. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Maybe Mark, we uh, follow up on that. Um, do you th would you agree on all those points, or is there something where you say maybe engineers becoming inventors wouldn't make so much sense? I agree that the, there is this shift, and the question just is how, how do we how do we face this, right? Like how do we go after it? And and the cl classical approach in engineering is, if you think of the V approach, is that um, it's a very waterfally way of thinking, right? Like you you go and do one thing, and then you do the next, and you validate, and so on. And I think. If you look at the most successful companies today, like look at SpaceX, no rocket that they launch is like the last one. That's not a waterfall approach, right? Like what you do is you actually change the hardware as you go, you change the requirements as you go, you, you adapt to it, you reuse parts, right? You start having modular products in which uh, you're always improving one part, but it goes into several of them. And I think um, we have to go away from this idea uh, which was possible with documents and the old way of thinking to like fix something, set it in stone, and then do the next step. And have to come to an agile way in which um, there are these iteration cycles. And then we have to accept that changes happen. And it's rather the question of how do we adapt our tools and processes to help us deal with constant change um, then to try to prevent it and try to uh, freeze things off and say we will never touch it again because we can see that the companies who do that, they fall behind, right? Like these are the companies that will not develop the products of tomorrow. They, they will be far too late with what they do. We have to learn from software engineers who learned that you have to build something, learn, validate, get it better, keep improving. And, and that's the kind of cycle we have to go into also when we come to full product design. Interesting, yeah. Bastian, maybe when we think about product development processes and going through the different phases, is there something that comes to your mind where it's like, um, from a theoretical perspective, it's quite easy to say, okay, we have to adapt um, product development processes in different stages, whether that's front loading with simulation, using AI to augment engineering workflows. Is there something else that, else that comes to your mind where you say, this is something engineers could use, uh, practically use, and become more agile in the future? Mm. Um... So may, may, maybe there are uh, two aspects on that. Um, uh, so the first one is, um, I, I believe it's great when you accomplish it to make a kind of learning by doing approach uh, uh, with new software tools. So in most of the cases, when we introduce um, generate, generative design in, in some of our projects, the uh, engineers had to think differently. So they had to think in uh, requirements um, at the first hand and try to formulate these requirements uh, in a super uh, measurable way. This is either way what you try to achieve, but uh, uh, the integration of software even forces you to do this uh, um, from start to finish. Yeah? Um, and so uh, what our engineers learned is uh, to describe objects uh, in a way that uh, a computer can understand that. Yeah? And uh, beside that also try to 
uh, find the right balance between details and uh, generalization of the uh, problem. So this is what we saw when we uh, use generative design for, for building infrastructures where we try to improve, improve the processes and beside that also make a very uh, appealing uh, body that really pleases the people who are working in there. What was really a, a highlight in such kind of projects is that uh, you as a design team or as an engineering team, you do not do the work on your own. Um, specifically, generative design invites other people who have to use the product in the end of the day in order to implement their requirements and their wishes right from the beginning. Um, and this is something what our um, what not only the design teams, but also uh, the uh, blue color people who have to work in such kind of environments in the end of the day, what they, um, yeah, what, what, what they um, like very much um, in, in the end of the day, because uh, by introducing these new process, we can take people uh, into account that didn't play a role in, in state of the art design processes before. So I believe there's a, a huge shift to really make a collaborative work uh, enabled by software um, in order to find better solutions than before. This is my belief. Mm, I totally agree, Sebastian. Before we jump into the aspect of beta, maybe Sebastian, any last comments on the collaborative approach? Do tools, let's say engineering tools, whether that's simulation, artificial intelligence tools, you think about, do they need to have something like a collaboration feature implemented to make sure that engineers are cross-functional teamwork is actually working in real life? Yes, definitely. So um, if I have a look at EDAC, uh, we are engineering supplier and uh, even today in our huge projects uh, developing a whole car, it's all about collaboration. And most of the, most of the um, faults and uh, mistakes are based because of, yeah, yeah, of not good working communication. Yeah, so so there's one goal that we have, to, of course, this is uh, this so-called um, yeah single source of truth. Yeah. So and in all our automated development processes and so on, we we need to uh, make them accessible to everyone who's working on those processes and to understand what is what is processing there and what did my colleague do there um, in this process. So that's very important, I think, and. Yeah, and what also Marco said is very important. Um, the, on the one side, the collaboration. On the other side, that we uh, free our engineers from the manual work. And on the other side, what Marco said, that we um, yeah, use data that is gained from, from our products, that we see how, how our products are used in, by our customers. And um, maybe I can give you a glimpse uh, on, on, a, on a short example how that could look. So um, maybe I can share my my screen. Um, just one one screen there. Um, it's a um, project at EDAC. We are developing a so-called city bot, a robot that is uh, working in cities to cover all the mobility needs. And, and the big change there is that we don't develop a product um, that is fixed and and ready then, but um, we will use live data collection to continuously improve our our product, our city bot. And yeah, to not have a start of production and then it's finished, but to having a continuously evolution, a continuously update of the city bots um, and to improve it constantly. And that's something that I also wanted to point out that we have to think in data, that we have to really understand our customers and that we can adapt agile to changing to conditions in a collaborative way, of course. <laughs> That's so interesting, yeah. Um, thanks, Sebastian, for the insights. Also, super cool bot, by the way, and we'll get more to AI in a few seconds. Um, there was one question from Wolfgang. Nice to see you, Wolfgang, by the way, which is more around the aspect of CAE and the cloud. That also brings us to data slash simulation. So let's open or go with the next question of data and simulation. So where do you see data in the future? Of course, we produce a ton of data, exabytes, petabytes of data every day. Um, how do you see engineers using data, whether that's historic data or data just produced um, just in time um, in, the in the future? Maybe Moritz, um, how do you see that data problem being solved? 
I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it as a problem. I'm seeing it as a chance. I guess we are generating so much data also in the product development and also in the live data later of the product. And it, it's a treasure that we just have to look at. And I guess the, the um, complexity of this data is to make it like accessible for engineers, to make it readable, to make it uh, accessible. And also, as uh, Sebastian said, to implement it in the product development process at all. So the huge challenge will be in the future uh, how do we actually interpret all these big data that are flying around? How do we unify the data? How do we have like a common data model? And how do we get it back to the engineering to the engineers who could learn from this data and improve the quality or even reinvent the product? This is becoming the challenge. And I guess there are, there are nice tools out there. And uh, I guess at the end, it's, it's just a new playground for engineers to make use of this huge data and invent it. I love it, Moritz, that you say shift the perspective from actually it being a problem, but actually saying that it's a solution or like an opportunity that engineers could leverage Absolutely. data. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's so cool. Um, Marco, maybe on the data aspect, um, when we think about data lakes, data silos, um, where do you see that? How can that be deployed, especially for engineers? Where do we store the data? Especially when we think about demographic changes, a lot of old engineers, whether that's working in the wind tunnel, old engineers go away. Where do we keep that data? How can we make use of that? Do you think about this? Um, so to me, there's two kinds of data that we're actually talking about, right? I think you've just mentioned a lot of where we have these data lakes, we have tons of data, right? There's tons of measurements and so on. And there is a, a room for uh, AIs to help engineers make like sense of that data and to find patterns and to like do predictive maintenance and all of these other things. But I think there's also a second kind of data, which is more intentional data, right? Like if you think of your product and you're wondering, What's the power consumption of that product in standby mode? Um, that's an important data point. It's not tons of data. It's just a question of where do I find that specific information, right? So, and I think we have to think of them as two different aspects of it. One of them is where we have parameters and gathered data, which is in the millions. And the other one is part of your model of what you're trying to develop. And uh, maybe also here sharing just one, one short screen um, when we, we think of the when we think of the um, life cycle of, of developing a product, I have the feeling that the most important part is that we need to have that same data across that life cycle. Um, and here I'm not talking about the measurements. Here I'm mostly talking about like the design data, right? So if you say that your car should be able to have a, a reach of so and so many kilometers, uh, you should have that as data available when you're making design choices of if you're using motor A or B, you should have that available when you're uh, calculating for different driving cycles. You should be able to compare that in reviews to competitors and so on. You should be able to, if there's a change in the voltage of your motor, it should directly have an impact on that range and check whether that's still true for the requirements. That same data you should be able to test against, right? So like, there's no reason why you would write test procedures um, which contain like just words, but it should have the same data applied that you have been using all the time. And I think that's an important distinction. One of them is data that we have in these data lakes and that we want to analyze and where we want to learn about the product. And others is design data that we need to also track along the life cycle. And I think we need solutions to both of these things if we want to make use of data in, in, in engineering. Mm, very interesting. Do you see Marco maybe AI as one of the solutions to tackle this problem or is it like a synergy of different solutions? I think it's a synergy. To be honest, I, I feel uh, we, we sometimes at Valley Space, we, we think about it um, as a data pyramid. Okay, so basically what you have at the very bottom is you have the data, right? Like you, you, and then you start connecting that data and then you start to automate stuff and then you start to actually get insights of that data. And I think at the end, there is optimization that you can do on top. And I do think that for the upper parts for insight and optimization, AI will help us, obviously, right? It, it will be a, a guiding tool. However, as long as our data is just documents, <laughs> as long as we have all the information about a product in a Word file, there is no way of doing very useful things on top of it, right? So I do think it's a multi-step process in which you first need to make sure that you describe your product in a systematic way um, uh, where the data is connected, and then what you can do is on top of that, start making optimizations and so on uh, with, with, with um, aiding tools. But the first step is not even AI that we need. It's just a shift from document-based to database. 
Interesting. Can I see Oliver raise the hand? So don't want to hold you back, Oliver. Go for it. Yeah, just a, just a remark. Um, I, I I think I, I can help on these lower levels um, with information extraction, with document classification, with um, yeah, extracting the information, classifying whether a document is a drawing or an analysis report, whether it describes a problem or not. Because this is what many engineers, from my experience, do today manually. There is somebody who knows where is stuff and where to find which information. And say basic machine learning tools like text classification, um, they can help to extract the information from old documents and make it available to, to humans and also to computers um, to build yeah, more, more complex stuff on it. Definitely interesting. When we think about maybe not so much about text documents, um, maybe more about generative design aspects or like 3D data, like CAD modeling. Do you think that 3D data, especially AI for 3D data, will be, become more relevant for engineers in the future? Maybe, Bastian, do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> I'm just replying to a question here. Um, so uh, can, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, we were talking about data, especially like text-based data. So do you think like that 3D data, for example, for engineers such as using AI on CAD geometries will become more relevant in the future? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So this is uh, one of the uh, problems I'm, I have in, my, uh, in, in one of my uh, upcoming projects. Um, first of all, data are not existing or they are confidential. Uh, but you need um, at least the physical boundary conditions um, uh, and physical dimensions uh, of a, a, a product. And I believe um, to use uh, yeah, um, 3D scanning data, um, try to automate this as, as good as possible, uh, use AI for tasks like cleaning up uh, such kind of data is, is becoming super crucial. Uh, what I experience is in most cases, we do not have the data. You know? So uh, for, for instance, you try to use generative design to optimize a um, production environment. Most of the tools and jigs are not existing in 3D, 3D data or they are super hard to get. Um, so I would try to focus on developing uh, quick solutions to rebuild or re-engineer such kind of data and then uh, use them in your, in your process. Very interesting. And now that we also talk about um, artificial intelligence, and of course there are like different groups of artificial intelligence uh, defenders or like, um, yeah, who are pro-AI, who say that AI will substitute engineers in the future, whether that's in computational fluid dynamics, structural mechanics, um, I see Oliver already shaking his head and we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> um, I see it rather that humans plus AI, they will augment each other so that AI will help the engineers to increase or enhance their workflows. Um, maybe you have a different opinion on that, Sebastian? Maybe comment on that? Um, so there are specific uh, roles or specific engineering tasks that will be replaced. So there are some engineers, yeah, they, they really have, uh, they are afraid. And I'm sure that there are some specific tasks and some specific engineers who will be replaced for sure. But I'm sure that they can, um, yeah, get new tasks. And as you said, yes, it's all about collaboration. And um, in general, I don't think that we will um, have less engineers in future than, than today. We will have even more engineers in the future that we need that collaborate with, with the new tools. But to be honest, there are always some, uh, some uh, roles and some tasks that are substituted. And for them, for those engineers who are doing the manual work today and um, which manual work will be automated, for those, uh, for those colleagues, for those engineers, we will have to find a new work and we have to learn them how to collaborate with artificial intelligence and how to let the manual work be done by by uh, algorithms and that will be is a, that is already a big topic for us so we, will, we definitely have to find a new work for for people whose work is not uh, relevant anymore or what is automate automized so um yeah that, that is definitely a challenge but yeah in total um, it's more about cooperation, but for specific engineers, 
there will be uh, some some issues upcoming. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, and I think Marco, you have a specific example on that aspect. Yeah, definitely. Like, let me just quickly share one picture because I think it it brings the the point home, right? Like, I, I think if you look at look at this uh, this picture, which is uh, from the Hidden Figures movie, and if you look at what people are doing there, these are engineers in the '60s building the moon uh, landing uh, vehicles, right? And you can see there's a guy in the back, and he's on a big table, and he's doing drawings by hand. And of course, what Sebastian just said is true, right? Today, there is no one sitting on these kind of tables and drawing these things. That doesn't mean that there isn't CAD engineers who have to do, um, like, who have to build the physical uh, parts that we, we, we need. Uh, what they need is they need different kind of uh, expertise. They need to understand what the boundary conditions are. They need to know how to optimize and so on. Same is true for if you look here in the very front, right? Like you see all these papers and there is people who, in these days and up to today, just making sure that the right version of the right document is being used and so on. And of course, that's not what the future brings, right? There is not going to be a person in 10 years who still says version four is the official one. Uh, but there is going to people, uh, be people who make sure that uh, design baselines between different products are coherent and uh, to make decisions on, on certain of these aspects. So I think um, tools change, uh, but the overall engineering aspects will, will keep being there. And it's, it's a matter of getting people accustomed to that, uh, that they should think of the outcomes. What do I want? I want a physical design in the end. I want a coherent data. I want to take design decisions. And if they think of the outcome, these same kind of outcomes engineers will be working on all the time. It's just going to be different ways and tools to achieve this. And hopefully, they're going to be more interesting and less manual work and less stupid work where it's just copy pasting or where it's just comparing two documents and so on to each other like oliver said it's not about then looking is this a drawing or not and i can tell you but what do i do with that information yeah and i i want to um add one thing is that if you have a look at the um, guys doing the drawings um the, the shift or the change was that they're doing the drawings now virtually in cad but not in, in physics there is a difference to today because um, maybe our engineers won't do any drawings, even physical or, or visual anymore. So there's definitely, I think it's a bigger step from, from uh, doing, um, doing a drawing by hand or doing a drawing in CID still manually by hand. Then the shift that, is, uh, um, that we face today is that no one has to do drawings anymore. And this, this topic could be automized. So I think the, the, the changes, uh, that we are facing in the next maybe 10 years uh, will be much yeah much bigger than uh, in the last 50 years that we saw on your picture from from the drawing to the CID is it a step from the CID to the automized uh, processes I think is a much bigger step than we uh, um, had in the past yeah. I think we will come back to that in a few seconds Oliver AI plus engineers what do you think you, sh you shook your head a few minutes ago what do you think on that aspect um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think AI will not replace engineers. Uh, engineers do many engineers do a lot of repetitive work today, which is not really academic work. Mm -hmm. I think AI can assist engineers in in repetitive tasks like measuring things or whatever. Yeah, um, which still needs a sort of an intelligence because you need vision for that or whatever or recognize patterns but it's repetitive and, and error prone um, so ai should assist engineers with that stuff with this repetitive error prone stuff and engineers should focus on problem solving or finding new solutions really become creative because whenever you talk about ai um, th this is what ai cannot do today um, we, we call it AI, but it's very narrow. Yeah, they, they're trained on very specific tasks. It's not the, the general intelligence that a human has. Um, uh, these, these, say, machine learning algorithms hardly know about context. Um, so that's what engineers should do: be creative, solve problems that that require context. Um, and all of these are just one-time jobs, you know, that's the, um, that's the difficult things on it. You don't do that a hundred times, you do it once, but the things that you today do a hundred times, that should be automated 
by either a simple algorithm or by a clever machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. Fully agree. Moritz, on the generative design aspect, where do you see AI helping engineers maybe in the future, especially when we think about stuff such as deep fakes, where AI is not really that creative, I would call it, but more like expands our creativity space? Yes, I would would maybe take AI just as another tool from engineers like the finite element simulation. So we do not mm -hmm. drive the cars to the wall anymore. We have it visually. And AI is just another tool that engineers will have to use in the future. And um, there will be several aspects. And if you're talking about generative design, definitely there will be some algorithms coming up with new forms and functions there. But this is just like you can, can use it in your product development if, to get more like ideas on the table or to learn from the past. So it's just a really interesting new tool. And the good thing is, we can use it as engineers because we are able to either have the algorithms and, and on the second hand also have the data available. I guess this is something which is really necessary to, to think about. We do not only want to have the data of the past because if we learn the AI on training data of the past, maybe there will be new, new inventions. I guess at some point the creativity has to come into play. And uh, I guess this, if you're talking about deep fakes, I just... Uh, had something in mind that for the image recognition for, for people, for example, if you only train it with white people, um, the algorithm will not be as good as at the face recognition in the colored people. And this is like a huge problem also for engineers in the future. If you train your model with the wrong data, it will just not be able to solve your problem. Absolutely. A bias is also a very big aspect. If you open that box, I think the discussion would be way too long, but obviously bias is a big aspect of uh, artificial intelligence. And I really love the answer that you gave Bastian, um, engineers who become more the orchestrators of solutions rather than defining specific solutions by themselves, which is really interesting. Um, any comments on the AI aspect or other engineering solutions or tools um, that engineers might leverage in the future? Maybe just one comment from my side. Um, oh. Sure, Oliver, go. Sorry. Um, it's not just not just uh, being generative. What also helps is accelerate things. Yeah, like um, when you have uh, costly, long duration uh, CFD or FE analysis, you can use um, say machine learning solutions, either surrogate models or physics informed neural networks to accelerate that by orders of magnitude. That helps. Yeah, it's Definitely. not fancy. It's it's not fancy AI inventing something, but it's something that really helps. I think that's more important. Don't, don't look for these fancy things, AI invented whatever. It's what, what does really help. Definitely. And that would also bring us back to the data aspect. So if you use something like physics informed neural networks, or AI for fluid for simulations, we have to ensure as engineers that we use high fidelity simulations in the first place to train these algorithms. So yeah, definitely also a data aspect again, um, a data problem. Bastian, you wanted to say something on the engineering orchestration issue? Yeah, um, so yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, when you say uh, what, what other stuff comes comes to your mind in terms of AI, um, I've seen a pretty interesting approach uh, coming from um, Autodesk in this case. Um, they collaborated with a person who was looking at how people are learning uh, and he tried to implement this into uh, future uh, cut tools. Um, and they developed a method or they applied a method that uh, was called uh, think loud uh, um, or speak loud or something. Um, so the designer was uh, sitting in front of his computer using cut and he had to speak loud the, uh, um, the things that he had in mind in terms of how we want to build up things in 3D. Yeah? So I make a hole here, I make a spine, I make blah, 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 uh, whatever. Um, and they tried to make the computer understanding um, yeah, uh, what the designer has in mind. Um, so the hypothesis was when you do this often enough, the computer will understand what your design intention will be. So when you, uh, make a, when you draw a circle, the computer will maybe propose by itself that you want to create a cylinder. Um, or something. And I believe uh, this is super interesting um, to have um, this, this kind of active collaboration uh, between the computer and the designer by itself. And also Valley Space had a very nice video right uh, in the beginning when they've been founded uh, with a fake Elon Musk, yeah, uh, which also showed 
in a great way how this could work uh, in the future uh, when you think this over the top. You know? So uh, natural voice recognition combined with algorithms that you can change this will be super powerful in the future, I believe, as a, a man machine interface. I think there's an audio issue on your side, Bastian. We continue. Okay. The AI has a difficult uh, problem. <laughs> yeah, translating Bastian's voice. Um, good, good point. Um, maybe going a bit away from artificial intelligence aspect, thinking about engineers and their studies and how they learn and learning how to learn actually as a very important skill for engineers in the future. What do you think? Should engineers go more deep into one topic in the future or do engineers have to be more broad, more, more T, T type personality, like learning about AI, FEA, algorithmic thinking, as Oliver mentioned earlier on. Um, what would you say here? Maybe Marco, do you have any thoughts on that? Going more broader or going more specific into one niche? Or does it depend on the job? I, I really think that this, that the, that this depends, that there is going to be both at all, as always, you will need project managers and system engineers who really understand the broad part and can go deep. Um, but there are some parts when you are very deep into fluid dynamics, you can ask any systems engineer, and they will have no idea of how to solve those problems and even to understand the algorithms or the simulations. So don't think there is a, at least for me, there's not a clear answer. There will be only this or that. But what I do think is, no one can ignore the digitization of it. No one can ignore that things are moving. So whichever path you pick, be it very specialized or be it very broad, you better have an understanding of what the cutting edge tooling is that will arrive at those outcomes that you're trying to do in this field. So if you want to know what does digital agile systems engineering mean in the future, you better have an idea of what that looks like, right? Like if you want to, um, be the best at fluid dynamics, you better know how AI can help you in that part and um, how to train those, AI, or basically or how to at least use those AI um, featured systems. Um, and I think the depth of knowledge will help you do that um, so that it's not just a black box and but that you can validate with your own experience whether what you get out makes sense or not for your specific application. Mm -hmm. Got it. Do you think there's like specific toolings or learning approaches on how we can facilitate learning for engineers in their job? Maybe Moritz, do you have a strong opinion on that? Yeah, I like the, the gamification and continuous learning approach. I mean, uh, I try to do a scary thing every day, just something that I haven't done before. And I think this is also something uh, which I yeah, can, can really recommend to do. Uh, learning new things uh, has to be fun and it really challenges you, uh, challenges you all day. Um, but it really brings you further. And I guess if we uh, also have software where this can bring in tools that are easy to use and game, enable gamification and learning new things, and maybe also not writing code, but enabling people to write code visually um, or to access the AI tools very easily, um, this really helps to access new technologies. And also I think this helps people in exploring new functionalities of the future of engineering. Yeah. Very cool. I really love that when I checked out Elise, that it's more like a visual approach rather than just having like a bunch of code snippets laying around and just executing that um, that script or that code, which is uh, super interesting. Um, Oliver, do you have a specific opinion on learning how to learn as an engineer, how we can accelerate that or optimize it? Uh, um, optimize? Uh, yeah, I, I think, first of all, you, you have to continuously try it yeah so if, if you stop learning 30 years ago then it's going to be difficult to start again so but if you just continue to learn regularly i think that's easy that, that, that helps um what what companies um com companies can help with that um um but yeah companies can help with that but they they need to have a certain culture that allows for a certain time where you learn and experiment and, and try something new and don't expect the first time right thing every day um, i think that's difficult for many traditional companies to make this um, cultural change and also for traditional managers they feel loss of control or whatever they fear um, that that's something where I think uh, new companies, smaller companies uh, definitely have an advantage and people working in smaller companies have an advantage. 
to make it a bit more practical right now. Okay, Bastian, you have a comment on that? Yeah, um, so what, what I usually tell my students is uh, um, you still need to be good at, uh, by starting with a blank sheet of paper to draw an idea. This is still valid for all engineers, yeah, beside AI and so on. You need to be good in executing your task in a 3D world, yeah, so modeling and, and so on, simulating. Then you have to electrify it. Yeah, this is also something that you learn with your studies, yeah. Uh, but try to be really good in it. And then you do the programming, you give it intelligence. If you are good in all these four disciplines, you can do everything, yeah, no matter what. I, that's, that's, that's also one, one of my beliefs. Mm, that's interesting. At Before least I'm telling this my students. Yeah. Before we jump to the next question, uh, Bastian, do you think they would also shift more into the digital world? Like when we talk about the metaverse, do you believe engineers will have meetings in the metaverse, do construction simulations in the metaverse? Maybe that's a stupid like future vision, but is it possible? Well, of course it's possible, but all the um, uh, uh, movies we see that talk about uh, using using glasses and so on, uh, these movies usually described um, a fucked up dystopia for us. Uh, so I, I personally could find some use cases here, but I won't use this in my daily life. Uh, even during COVID, uh, I really appreciate the physical presence of my colleagues uh, and the interaction with them. Uh, you will never replace this by any means of uh, AI, VR, and, and, and so on. Yeah, I would fully agree on that. Good input. Marco, any comments on that as well? Yeah, I, I agree with what Bastian said in the sense that um, it's always going to become kind of a mix, right? You will have a whiteboarding session in which you want to pe put people in a room, maybe in a virtual room if, if they are not here, right? And, and if you, you want to like throw out ideas and like start really brainstorming, um, you will also want to be able to collaborate when people are not in the same room, right? When there's COVID or when you have a supplier who's in Japan and the other person is in the US and you will want to seamlessly keep working on that same data. So I... I, I don't see a future in which everything is shifted to one single place. I rather see that it gives us, like more it said before, more options in a tool, <laughs> in a, in our tool chain, uh, more ways of of how to do it. And in an ideal case, it feels seamless. The same way that you like go to Facebook on your PC and then you later keep uh, finishing that message that you were wrote, writing to your friend on your cell phone. That's the same way, right? Like you're gonna be like working. Uh, in a room with people where you have on a on a screen all the data that you're making a trade-off with, but then you, with one click, you get the reviews from your colleagues in a different time zone. And in the next moment, um, you're making the optimization uh, results go into a place where everyone has it on their dashboards where they're currently working. So all of this is going to be interconnected, but not necessarily in one physical or virtual place. Love it. Very cool. Uh, with respect to time and maybe have time for one or two more questions at the end. Um, we wanna go away so that the audience has some practical tips um, and takes away some practical tips from the session. We do a round robin right now and each of you should give one skill an engineer needs to have in the future and maybe one general tip for engineers in the session. And uh, let's start with maybe Oliver. All right, uh, one skill, um, cool. um, learn to learn. Um, really, it, it'll change. Um, this is what, what I learned at university uh, 30 years ago, there's so many things have uh, uh, evolved meanwhile in terms of optimization algorithms, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, so that's important, learning to learn. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific source that you use on a day-to-day -day basis where you learn? Oh, um, I, I did a lot of a lot of machine learning stuff the last year. So, of course, I really like Coursera mm -hmm. um, for for that. Um, but I read papers, um, um, and then you use the internet to find stuff. Um, well, I think that 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 covers it, Oliver. Very good insights. Cool, um, Moritz. One skill and maybe one general tip for engineers. Uh, be open to new things. I guess this is something which I would recommend. Um, uh, I've, I've seen it in the past from people who are saying, well, I have done this like a couple of times ago and I think it's good and I do not want to have like a new idea on, the, on my mind. So I guess being open, 
for new people, also talking to people who have a different approach, maybe a different tool or different skill set, different mindset is really something which I can recommend. And uh, if it comes down to a practical advice, uh, definitely Python is the super easiest thing to learn. And there are nice tutorials out there, just getting Hello World examples, uh, I can recommend. Very cool. Yeah, Bastian, I saw that you wrote brilliant.org, which I would also like highly recommend. Anything else? Uh, I, I, I just yeah, I, I just uh, acquired a license, so uh, let, let's see. Uh, I love ma uh, mathematics and, and so on too, also to get the basics uh, done right. But if you want to have a recommendation for engineers, <laughs> if you want to make money, you need to be uh, scrum masters today. Yeah, so <laughs> leave your topic. Um, or, no, well, no, uh, honestly, uh, uh, try, try to be uh, good also in programming and uh, in, in topics like um, everything that has to do with electrics and, and, and so on. And, and draw, draw by hand, draw by hand so, so often, so hard, uh, buy uh, a tablet and a pen, do this virtually, you develop great workflows that are really fun. That's my recommendation. Love it, Bastian. Cool. Marco? Um, so for learning, I, I would say something slightly different. I would say, um, um, like, try to get a full system understanding of something. So basically what I really like is, I don't know, you can look up, for example, the failure reports on why the Hitomi spacecraft failed. It's online and it will explain all the things that can go wrong in the system. And it will you will start understanding how all these things like fit together and how, how different parts of the complex system like have interactions to each other. So I think system thinking is probably the one thing that every engineer can learn about. And that's just one of the practical way of doing it. And uh, when it comes to general tips, um, I think especially for people in companies, what we've seen so far is often that people get, are afraid of change because they say, oh, if we change, then we now have to change that whole process. And that's a whole hundreds of people working with this. Like, how are we ever going to change? And I think my key recommendation is start small, but start. Um, the most, like, the most successful changes that we've seen um, in organizations is when people pick one project or one aspect of a project and say, we're going to make this different this time, right? Like, let's just digitize this part. Let's just work slightly different this time. And then you get learnings and that's the iterative approach, right? It's getting out of the idea that you can plan it all ahead and make a five-year roadmap of how you want to change and work in the future and start doing something different today in your project with your school and the learnings that you'll get from this, they will directly inform what to do next. Love it, very elaborate answer. Yep, really love it. And last but not least, Sebastian. Yeah, I would say stay curious. So if you are, st cur if you are still curious, you will learn and you will be open-minded to, ch to changes and you will face changes. So stay curious and, and um, yeah, take every challenge as a chance, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I love it. Very nice tips, very practical tips as well. I really love the session. Also nice comments on where you could um, enhance your skills, such as LinkedIn courses. Euclidia is great in building, taking stuff apart, de-engineering it, reassembling it. Um, very cool tips as well. So if there are no more questions, I give it one more minute. Uh, it was very nice talking to all of you. Very nice answers from the panelists. A lot of inquisitive participants as well. Um, I definitely enjoyed it. And there's an end poll, of course, that you can... Um, think about now because we asked you in the future are you now more positive about the future do you feel more positive or more negative now what do you think okay that has a big shift now everyone is positive about the future that's great so I think with that positive attitude, we can close the session. I wish you all a great rest of the day uh, from wherever you're watching this right now. Um, and I would say see you at the next event. And big thank you to all the panelists um, participating today. See you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. Bye-bye.